morning, everybody. My name is, is Ron Cookson. I'm the Senior Vice President for the Technip Offshore Wind. And it's my pleasure to introduce the share fair this morning um, with my panel of experts in procurement and developers in projects. The purpose of the share fair is part of the UK government's industrial strategy to inform the masses, the interested parties in offshore wind on the near-term projects and in particular the status of those projects. It is an opportunity to discuss them with the speakers but for this session there will be no questions and answers but on the assumption I can manage time reasonably well there will be a short opportunity at the end to, uh, to meet with all of the speakers and the speakers today in order of speaking is we have David Sweeney who is the offshore manager for Mainstream NNG project we have Richard Copeland who is the, um, represents Repsol on the Inchcape project, Roger Windmill, UK procurement manager for Dong Energy, and Ray Thompson, who probably doesn't need any introduction whatsoever, who is the head of the supplier market for Siemens Wind Power. Could I ask you to make sure your phones are on silent or switched off? In addition to the share fair itself, um, Renewables UK today will issue the latest version of the Timelines project. And for those that have been here last year and the year before, it's a sequence of information which identifies all of the projects in the UK government's offshore wind program. It identifies when those projects will come to market, the size of the projects, number of turbines, types of foundations likely, dates of consent, etc., etc. And there's a, Reese has a fan fold here and available also on the Renewable UK stand um, after this event. We are followed at quarter past ten by um, the next session, so we do want to keep it to time. And with no, no further ado, I would ask David, please, to come to the stage and make his presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, glad to see so many of you early on the second day. I don't think I've actually ever made it before myself, but um, just jump straight in. Uh, just quickly introduce Mainstream, and I'll introduce, uh, uh, just take you through the, the project. Uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of you do know the Nart Naguia project nowadays, and then give you a bit of insight into uh, what we're doing in the coming um, year and a uh, number of years to uh, to get our um, first generation in 2017. But quickly uh, on mainstream, um, the world is undergoing a one-off transition of sustainability. I mean, this is really our, 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 our key messages and, and, and absolutely what uh, Dr. Eddie O'Connor uh, believes in when he set up mainstream uh, after Air Tristy. Um, we were set up to lead and, and accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to renewables. And our business is the development, financing, constructing and operating of wind and our solar energy plants. We partner with utilities, investment companies and global consumer brands. Uh, our business model is to align with uh, our partners. Um, our independence enables flexibility and timely execution of projects. Um, we approach our projects with a vision. Uh, very entrepreneurial for those that do know uh, Dr. Eddie O'Connor and, uh, and the rest of the team in Dublin. And our goal is simply to minimise risk, uh, to maximise gains and accelerate the pace of renewables. So mainstream, 170 uh, staff around the world. Uh, we will operate our onshore and, uh, business in uh, uh, Chile, um, America, Canada and South Africa and our offshore business predominantly in, in Europe with both the, the Hornsey and Narnaguia and Horizon in Germany. Um, this is, uh, there's actually a new slide for this in the last week because we've started operating in, in South Africa as well with the, the handover of our solar plants and our Jeffreys Bay um, uh, wind farm is now uh, uh, commercially operating. So there's the, the, the three um, offshore projects. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you know where they are. And this is the timeline uh, from, from mainstream again. I'm pretty sure you've seen the slide before, but Narnaguia is here, what I'm uh, due to talk about. 
Not too far from here on the East Coast, 15 kilometres uh, off uh, the coast of Fife, uh, 450 megawatt capacity, and water depths between 45 and 55 metres. And the grid connection has been secured and we expect that in 2016. We submitted our offshore consent, um, it seems a long time ago, and it is, in July 2012. Our onshore consent was submitted in November and we have received our uh, onshore consent uh, last year. Uh, we gave some further information uh, to refine our, our design envelope uh, for our consent application last year. We were halfway through the majority of our uh, detailed geotech and uh, moving on we will be um, uh, mobilising in the coming weeks to do our boreholes. Um, and the last one, is, Q2 2014, I don't have too long uh, left of that particular date, but fingers crossed that uh, we can hopefully see some consents in the first or fourth very soon. Just a quick one on some of the, the innovations, some of the work we are progressing. Uh, we've deployed um, a FLIDAR at Nartnaguia, is now uh, working and operating very well on site after a, an excellent validation exercise down at NAREC. Um, this essentially with a, a um, without putting a fixed met mast uh, on our site, we were able to use LIDAR on the coast, uh, FLIDAR uh, on site, and also uh, the NAREC met mast. And we have comprehensive uh, wind data which allows us to get the EPE figures we need and get to financial close. It's also an opportunity to show that NART does exist and we actually have something in the water there. Um, just a quick overview of, of what we're planning. The 450 megawatts are going to be made up with the 75 6 megawatt turbines. They will most likely be on jacket foundations. Um, they'll be routed back to one uh, offshore substation, all AC. 33 uh, kilometres, 35 kilometres of export cable. And we beach at Thornton Lock in East Lothian, which is just south of Torness Nuclear Power Station. We then got 12 kilometres of cable up to the Crystal Rig wind farm uh, in the Lammermuir Hills. So I'm sure most of you know the construction process of what we're doing. Uh, one, um, the, the, the first part we're obviously going to be looking at is uh, the pile installation. And at the moment we are doing some work on an onshore pile test to not only validate but optimise the technique of uh, drive drill drive. Um, really looking to minimise the costs of installation, minimise that time offshore. Um, so really focused uh, on that at the moment and, and we're doing some, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be doing some work in um, Q3, Q4 of this year uh, with um, a number of contractors. We'll be looking, as I said, jack installation. They'll be going on the pre-installed uh, piles. Um, and then we'll follow with a number of the other components, the offshore substation, and looking to have that installed um, in Q3 of uh, 2016. The export cable, uh, obviously everything lining up to do with the off to assets to allow us to get to that um, uh, 31st of March 2017 deadline for rocks, of which the project is, is obviously pursuing. We're looking at turbine installation and then commissioning and handover. In the meantime, we've also got all our onshore infrastructure is, um, needs to be installed. Um, and at the moment, we've, we're conducting surveys to start the discharge of our con consent conditions. Looking to, at some point next year, um, start, start some work uh, on, on the, uh, the onshore substation location. Uh, the schedule, um, as I said, I focus quite heavily on the two, 2017 date. We are going for rocks. It's a, um, an interesting and challenging uh, schedule. Um, so it's not for the faint-hearted, certainly there. Um, we're, we are going ahead with geotech. We're pursuing that. We, we're signed up to do that before um, our consent comes in. It's at our risk, but we need it to, to, to maintain our schedule. Financial close, again, quite challenging. It's in January of next year. Um, um, with the offshore construction starting end of next year and the, the start of um, uh, uh, 2016. Um, and it's all bringing in and looking to complete Norton Aguirre within uh, by 2018. 
So some of the procurement decisions, and I guess this is uh, you, you guys are, are, are most interested in. Um, there's a wee caveat at the bottom, um, obviously, and, and I'm pretty sure that you'll hear it again from, from others. We do need the consent before a lot of major items can be um, purchased, reserved, etc. But we're looking into construction port facilities for our turbines, um, our foundations, cables and uh, piles and offshore substation. We're looking into some of these at the moment with some key partners, um, but nothing at the moment is, uh, is set in stone on that one. The electrical transmission subsupplier, the off assets, again, we're, we're speaking to, uh, to a number of people there, and we look to, um, as soon as we are, are able to tell people who will be building that, then we will tell. A foundation fabricator, again, we're, we're engaging there. A substation fabricator. Uh, and then looking at the O&M strategy, and what vessel strategy we're going to be using and what poor facility we'll be using. And we are committed uh, through our environmental statement that obviously our O&M will be on the East Coast. It makes no sense for it to be anywhere else. So anywhere between Montrose and Eyemouth is, is where our O&M will be. And we're looking at both the, the mothership and the, the, the CTV solution um, for the site. Obviously being 15 kilometres offshore, both um, are, are capable of doing the O&M. Just to make sure that everyone, um, I'm not sure I'll be able to speak to everyone if anyone wants to speak to me uh, today, um, so I can't get around to everyone, but we do have a registration uh, site. Um, I believe that icon does work on the, if anyone uses their smartphone, it will take you to the supplier registration. Add in your details, add in any uh, additional uh, material. That comes back to, to us and we share it with all of our, uh, our partners. Um, and with our construction partners as well, any supplier information coming to them comes into a central database that we do and we share with, with everyone. So our turbines, our jacket suppliers, our cable suppliers bring in all their, their, their supply chain information to a central location. So yeah, I'd, I'd urge you all to, um, to get your information onto, onto that. And I believe that is the end of my short presentation. Um, it's just a whistle-stop tour of NART, really to give you a flavour of, of what's coming and um, the, sort of the, the, the challenge and time scales that, and I says, as again, it's not for the faint-hearted, so if you're up for it, then please uh, come and give me a, a shout. And there's my uh, contact details and the supply chain details as well for NART Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Richard, would you like to uh, take the floor? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I see nobody that, none of the people that led me astray last night have made it in yet, so I suspect there's going to be a few stragglers this morning, but uh, well done to everybody that made it in so early. Um, so as Ron said, I'm Richard Copeland, I'm the engineering coordinator uh, with Repsol and uh, I'm going to be giving you a bit of an overview of the Inchcape project, where we are at the moment uh, and basically our, our views on the supply chain and uh, our contracting strategy and I guess most importantly for, for yourselves how you can get involved in that process. So in terms of the Inchcape project itself, it's a Scottish territorial water site uh, it's located around 15 kilometres off the coast of Angus. Uh, it's fair to say it's one of the deeper water developments that are being pursued at the moment uh, with an average water depth of around 50 metres. Um, and one of the key drivers for us is our grid connection. Uh, so the, the, the cable route you see with the black lines down to uh, East Lothian, we have a grid connection point at Kikenzie uh, with a grid available for generation in uh, October of 2017. In terms of the, the companies that are involved in Inchcape, it's been developed by Inchcape Offshore Limited, which is a, a joint venture between Repsol and EDPR. Um, so just to give you an idea of the characteristics of those companies, um, Repsol are one of the world's largest integrated uh, energy companies, and EDPR are one of the world's largest producers of wind energy. So um, together we both have a large international presence and workforce, and we both have experience of uh, delivering large complex projects like Inchcape. Um, I think a key point to mention as well is both companies have established their, their UK offices in Edinburgh and uh, we've established significant uh, teams there as well. 
So just before I carry on, there's a, there's a couple of uh, caveats I'd like to add to just what I'm going to say. Um, first thing is we're, we're still awaiting the offshore consent determination for the project. We expect that to come uh, within the next couple of months. Uh, we also recently submitted our, our onshore planning application and we're expecting determination by uh, October of this year. And really the, some of these activities are all focused towards us uh, securing our uh, CFD, so contract for difference, our, our tariff, uh, which will apply for in October. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to say in this uh, presentation is really contingent upon us achieving those conditions. And that's not to sound negative, but it's to um, you know, just recognise that there are challenges facing the industry and uh, these projects. So we need to keep that in mind uh, when we're discussing these things. So this, uh, this graphic kind of shows you a, a bit of our project development process. Um, so where we are at the moment, we're just about to conclude our uh, concept selection engineering uh, process, which is effectively making some of the, the, the conceptual design decisions. So uh, turbine selection, foundation and substructure type, uh, the size and shape of the wind farm, etc. And that will be concluded within the, the next couple of months. Um, despite the challenges that we're, we're facing, we're also making a, a number of big commitments this year. For example, we'll be installing our, our offshore met mast and we'll also be uh, kicking off the uh, first phase of our detailed geotechnical campaign. Um, so these, these are quite big commitments for us to, to make and uh, it's really focused towards uh, delivering the project despite the, the challenges that we're facing. Uh, in parallel with this, we've been communicating with the supply chain and uh, developing our contracting strategy and really for the remainder of 2014 we'll be looking to go on and uh, implement that. So I'd like to just give you some of the considerations that we, we've been thinking about when we've been developing our contracting strategy and how we've arrived uh, at that. So I mean, first things first for us, we, we want to, to have industry leading HSE performance. I mean, uh, safety by design and incident free operations is something that we're really uh, focusing on in our, our development process. Um, as I said, there's a lot of complexities and risks and opportunities to do with the, the project um, and some of those are related to programme which are uh, again related to uh, supply chain constraints particularly when you, you, you consider uh, all the activity that's probably going to be going on around the same time. And really the message we've been getting from a lot of suppliers is to involve everybody much earlier on in the, the development process. Um, as well as a big drive for innovation, we need to see a, a, a step change and uh, the cost of energy for these projects to improve the, the IRR. And, and really that's led to us having a focus on the whole life cycle of the project. So uh, you know, bringing companies in earlier and also taking them through right to the, the, the execution and also uh, the operations phase of the project. So as people are actually thinking about the, the full life cycle. And as well, as I mentioned, the, 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 there's some uncertainties and uh, constraints uh, facing the industry at the moment. So we, we have to keep all of these things in mind uh, in developing our contracting strategy and, and think what's the, the most appropriate method to, to try and deliver a project like this. And, and based on those considerations and the feedback we've had, we've really been working towards more of a, a collaborative model um, with a focus on par partnering and aligning everybody's interests uh, between client and contractors. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking to, to work on a small number of major packages um, with tier one contractors and, and, and cons consortia um, really with a focus on capability, ability to optimise the project, partnering behaviour and uh, competitiveness in the broadest sense of the word. And really the aim of the process that I'll go on to describe in a bit more detail is to establish a, a project delivery team where everybody's interests are aligned uh, and we'll then go on to refine the project through the, the feed process in 2015 towards financial investment decision and then following on from that go on to execute the project. And uh, as I said, we've been gathering feedback as we went from the supply chain and we'll continue to do that. I think ultimately exactly what the, the, the group for the project delivery team will look like and the, the mechanisms that we'll use to align uh, interests will ultimately depend on the companies that are uh, involved in, and how we want to work together. So for the packages that we're looking at, um, we have turbine delivery. Uh, we, we've undertaken a joint procurement process with EDPR for the, the Maury Firth project and Inch Cape. And we're now down to a short list of uh, uh, turbines that we're looking at. And then we're really splitting the project into to two uh, major packages, uh, EPCI packages, that we, we see the capabilities of the supply chain aligning with. Um, first of all is delivery of the wind farm work, so uh, turbine installation, uh, EPCI for foundations and structures and uh, uh, inter-array cables. And then also the 
uh, transmission works in a separate package, uh, the offshore substation, export cable route and onshore substation. Um, and you, as I mentioned earlier, we're wanting to consider the, the, the full project life cycle, so it's likely that the companies that are involved in this are going to have form, some form of stake in the uh, sort of initial operational phases of the project. To give you an idea of the, the scale of these packages, we're really looking at things that are in the region of hundreds of millions to, to over a billion, so uh, huge uh, EPCI packages that we're looking at. In terms of what we've done to date, um, as I said, gathering feedback from the supply chain, so we issued a, a request for information. This wasn't a, a pre-qualification process, it was more uh, engaging a few, a few companies and saying, right, this is our thoughts on uh, the, our contracting strategy. How does that align uh, with what, what you're thinking is? Um, and the feedback we've had on the collaborative model and engaging people early has been, has been very positive. Um, we'll be going on to, to issue a request for proposals uh, in, in, in July this year with inspecting bids back in September and then looking to go on uh, to award in late October. And then really we'll be working to do some of the initial planning work and kick off uh, the feed phase in 2015, as I mentioned before. One thing I haven't mentioned and it will be part of this process is as part of the application for CFD we will have to uh, submit a project supply chain plan to DEC in August of this year. Um, and effectively the, 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 this is focusing on how the, the project will uh, create a viable and sustainable supply chain with a focus on three criteria, uh, innovation, competition and skills. Uh, and as well we're also uh, obviously considering the, the, the economic impact that uh, this project will have on the, the supply chain. So we're, we're ga gathering input from people on a uh, sort of informal uh, basis, events like this, but we'll also be seeking uh, sort of formal responses through the request for proposal process. So I guess most, most importantly for yourselves, how, how do you get involved in that process? Um, the first thing I'll say is despite the, the fact that we're, we're, we're going to be contracting with uh, tier one contractors or consortia, we see a lot of value and innovation, I think, coming at all levels of the supply chain. Um, but ultimately, as I said, what we're trying to establish here is a, a project delivery team. Um, and, and so the, the processes that we, we have set up will need to align with the, the companies that are involved in that. But there will be, um, we'll basically announce to the market who will be involved in the process and how to get engaged with that but at the appropriate time. Um, I think we recognise there's quite a lot of uh, fatigue in the supply chain at the moment, a lot of pricing and repricing and repricing, and uh, we're certainly not keen to contribute to that. Um, so essentially when we, when we come out you'll know that we are uh, serious and uh, effectively that we'll be having a very meaningful discussion uh, at that time and looking to, towards delivering something. I mean, aside from the, the RFP process that I've just described, um, there's also going to be other development activity continuing on the project. Um, the majority of that is contracted for the remainder of 2014 but there's always uh, opportunities arising and there'll be other uh, pieces of work that will need done outside of this uh, uh, delivery team that I'm describing. So, uh, effectively, I think the best thing to do is we've got a stand at the conference here, Stand 157. Uh, so come and speak to us and we, we can hear about your capabilities and how best uh, that will fit into what we're, we're planning to do for the project. Um, as well, you can also go to the Inchicape website, uh, down, the link down the bottom there. That gives you, obviously, more information on the project, but also uh, would enable you to register as a supplier for the project as well. And one point I'd just like to finish on is that we, you know, we've spent tens of millions of pounds to date and uh, over 95% of that expenditure has been in the, the UK supply chain. So there's big opportunities out there and, uh, and as I said, as a, the, the project uh, ramps up activity-wise, there's obviously going to be a lot more of that. Um, so we look forward to, to speaking to you and uh, seeing how you can uh, get involved in the project. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Roger, you want to take the stand? Feel free to elaborate a little. <laughs> we're slightly ahead of time. Okay. Oh, we jumped already from my uh, first slide. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Roger Windmill, very aptly named, as you will see. I'm uh, head of supply chain in uh, Dong Energy. And I'm here to today to talk to you about what is an absolutely amazing opportunity in offshore wind in the UK. For me to say that, I have to talk a bit about the pedigree of my company. We're the Danish home uh, uh, energy provider with uh, 
offshore wind interests in obviously Denmark, Germany, um, Holland, France, and by far the biggest, the UK. And we, we work through the whole of the value chain. So we're the largest developer, builder, owner, and operator of offshore wind farms. And that's what gives us the pedigree to be able to talk about the projects that we're going to deliver over the next five, six, seven plus years. So the projects. The first baby is Burbo Bank. Nice round figure, a billion pound construction op opportunity. We signed a CFD this year for it with FID later on in this year. And if you know uh, the Liverpool Bay area, where Burbo, the current Burbo uh, Bank uh, project is, it's an extension on that, that, that facility there. What's particularly exciting about this project is it's our first uh, uh, large deployment of the new uh, Vestas 8 megawatt machine. So uh, it's only 32, but with that power, we're going to produce 256 megawatts. If I jump to the other side of the coast, to our next uh, project, which we recently acquired from Centrica, we have Race Bank, twice the size of uh, Burbo extension, and an opportunity in excess of two billion. Unfortunately, Centrica were not uh, able to secure a, a CFD, but we will deliver this under the rock regime. That's how confident that we are that we can get this project done, and it's been run in parallel with our Burbo Bank project. 580 megawatts and a huge opportunity off that uh, east coast. Again, uh, the turbine we haven't, uh, I can't announce at this stage, but it will be a six megawatt plus machine. And all our projects you will see are, are on the new, the new level of machine. Shooting back to the west coast, to the uh, Liverpool Bay region again. So slightly after the, uh, the Burbo Bank extension and the Race Bank extension, um, we will be embarking on the Warney extension. Warney is up to 750 megawatts. She's uh, probably going to be delivered in two phases. We've also secured a CFD, and we, we look to uh, complete FID by the end of next year. Up to 209 turbines, and of course, uh, the larger machine, 6 megawatt plus. But what's uh, quite interesting about, uh, or challenging for us about Warney is, actually with the water depths and the uh, seabed conditions, we're going to have a mixture of, we're likely to have a mixture of uh, monopiles and jackets. We're talking about 20 jackets at this stage, but it'd be the first time we've moved off the monopile, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then the big baby, which is uh, Hornsey, off the east coast uh, in the Humber region. 1.2 gigawatts, probably in three phases. Really challenging project, 100 kilometers plus from shore. So we wrestled with the HVDC um, scenario. And, and I know it, as of today, we're looking at HVAC, but who knows whether that will change. Again, with the six megawatt plus machine, but a really challenging logistics when you've got to get people out that far offshore. So a real, real exciting portfolio of projects for the next five, six years for Dong Energy, and we have incredible confidence that we'll be able to build these projects. But that's not just all that's available. And I've got to talk about the projects we've got in construction at the moment. Um, Western and Sands, I had the uh, enjoyment yesterday of climbing up uh, one of Siemens 3.6 uh, megawatt, megawatt machines and peering off the top of uh, 
what we have now, all the turbines installed, and 80, um, as of yesterday, were, were generating. Um, we picked our construction uh, base, uh, which is a Belfast facility, which we've had a long-term and having a long-term relationship with, and, and a, an own, a small construction base in Barrow. But a commitment too for long term for the O&M out of uh, Barrow and Furnace as well. So it's a lovely new building. I got a nice picture of that after. And then Westernmost Rough, which we've uh, finally uh, installed all the uh, the monopiles, and uh, we've also installed the uh, substation jacket and top sides. She's progressing um, very well. But what's very interesting about this project for us is the first mass deployment of the six megawatt uh, Siemens machine. Again, uh, construction base, we've decided, uh, or we've been operating at a Grimsby fish docks, and we've, uh, we're currently building a nice new O&M base for the long-term commitment to that area. I need to mention the uh, O&M side, cause, as well as the construction, because um, I know the big construction projects are big numbers and are very, very exciting. But also, we we're talking of a 25-year commitment to those, those regions. So if you look at our uh, portfolio projects in the east and the west coast, out of the Liverpool Bay and Humber region, you know, this, this is a huge opportunity for, from a logistics, it's an, an obvious place to be for us, for O&M. You know, fast response to get out to the turbines to, uh, to provide staff, huge opportunity for those areas. So that's the size of the prize, that's the opportunities that we're going through. So I need to tell you a little bit about Dong Energy. I'm going to name a couple of key things about the supply chain that, that are really key on our, in our objectives at the moment. And the first one, and, and most obvious one, is health and safety. There are many parallels run with the uh, offshore oil and gas who have, uh, industry of an excellent, excellent uh, reputation in health and safety. And we need to... We need to uh, really step up to the plate and, and, and learn from our oil and gas colleagues. So Dong Energy, we're striving for excellence in health and safety. And if you, need, if you want to work with Dong Energy, you need to do the same. So we have a number of initiatives. I mentioned uh, you see it, you own it. You don't walk by. If you see a, a hazard, you raise it. If you, have a, if you see a problem, you raise it and get it dealt with. The other side is, um, I guess there isn't really a, a week that doesn't go by when um, the poor generators, the poor generators are being absolutely lambasted about the increased cost of energy. And as a, an industry, we really have a challenge because delivering uh, solutions to climate change through renewable energy is not a cheap option. So we're, we already have a huge number of people in the country suffering from fuel poverty. And we need to do something about that as an industry because we can't saddle the country with very, very expensive generation. So we have a, a huge program on reducing the cost of energy. I'll mention just but a few. But as a supplier to Dong, we really expect you to participate in this uh, in this journey really to get cost down. I, I, I'm sure there's not many suppliers here with margins of uh, 35, 40 percent. So uh, I would imagine that uh, squeezing your margin is not going to be the solution and we know that. So this is about uh, an, a wealth of initiatives to get the cost down. First of all I want to mention is uh, standardization. So I'll give you an example. We are currently out for the offshore substation for, uh, for Burbo extension, Warney extension, and Race Bank. And what we did is we made a conscious decision that we were going to make the top sides absolutely identical. I say absolutely identical. As near as identical as we possibly can, because there's a huge 
huge saving in design and benefits in the, in, in the learning curve in construction um, when you're making five instead of one substation. And we've already seen that working with Atkins, how we can drive costs out by using the same design for the next two projects. Innovation, crack, that's a big word and a big challenge for us. And I think probably the one that jumps out for me is that of the uh, monopiles. So I know it's been very frustrating for the industry to try and work out when, when do we swap over to jackets? When are we going to be in such deep water, in such large machines uh, that there's no option that we have to move to jackets? I have to say, we're trying to... <laughs> For those who are jacket makers, you might not want to hear this, but we're trying our best to delay that day as, as long as possible. So we are really pushing the envelope for monopiles. And the simple reason is cost. It's a huge increase in cost to go from a monopile to a jacket. We, will, uh, we would certainly get the metrics on that for our Warney project. But there's a lot of other opportunities. Um, of, of course, the, the bigger machines, 66 kV uh, transmission. Oh, there are a number of uh, opportunities out there, but we, we will be working with our supply chain on, on innovation to try and drive this cost down. It's not just going to come through margin. And the last thing uh, with my friend from Siemens here is it's really healthy. We need competition, as do the generators, as do the developers. We need competition in our industry. And uh, you know, with our recent announcement to go to uh, Vestas for the Burbo Bank extension, you know, we, we stand by that. And we need it in the industry. And that has, that has delivered us some considerable savings moving to that much larger machine. So our industry really is about sustainability. And my last point um, about the supply chain is probably quite a difficult um, message to give over under, as part of a member of the EU state. But um, what we need to do, we need to develop a sustainable UK supply chain. It needs to be world class. We're not just talking about um, a few bits and pieces for O&M, which are obviously going to come out of the UK. But we need to develop a, a world-class UK supply chain. And I have to say, Siemens, you have really been a game changer. And I'm really, really impressed and uh, pleased with the announcement of Hull. And that, is, uh, that has really helped us in uh, getting the message over how important it is to... to uh, to look at the UK supply chain because it has some very, very obvious uh, competitive advantages. And I'd say to any of you out there that are international uh, suppliers to the offshore uh, wind industry and you're not looking at manufacturing in the UK, you could be missing out on a huge opportunity in the biggest offshore wind industry. A little bit about, uh, this is a bit dry, I'm afraid. This is a bit about supplying to Dong. So let's talk about the specifics of um, how you can supply to Dong Energy. Well, as I mentioned, we are a, a Danish uh, state-owned company. So no surprise that uh, procurement is uh, highly centralized in Denmark. So I need to explain to you a little bit more about that. So I do, the, the, the UK is very, the, my team are very much focused on the, the local procurement, but all the major packages come out of Denmark. And they're split into four areas. So if you're a supplier into one of those four, area, four areas, you need to identify really who, who the key people are. But they're split into turbines, foundations, electrical systems, and O&M. And within the turbines, foundations, electrical systems, it includes the installation vessels for those particular areas. So you need to get over to Copenhagen. If you're an EPC provider, I'm sorry, but we're not the right client for you. 
We are very, very comfortable with a multi-package strategy. We understand it's key to our business that we must deliver and manage those uh, very difficult interfaces between the various packages. And we can't put that at risk and load up the projects with a large EPC um, um, cost, really. So we're uh, very, very comfortable to man up and take responsibility for managing interfaces. And we have a, quite a, a considerably uh, strong team in both logistics and engineering. So what are those multi-packages? This is where it gets a bit more difficult for today. Just to mention that uh, that's very important for us is having a portfolio gives us some tr real, real advantages. Because what we can do, is, when I talk about standardization, we can actually leverage the, the various uh, projects. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the three most recent uh, projects, uh, Race Bank, uh, Burbo and Warney Extension, where many, many of those packages are being bundled up together so that we can get the economies of scale of three huge, huge projects. So it will not be a surprise if you see tenders come out from us with uh, more than one project on. Now, I've talked about this before at uh, previous presentations, and I can't apologize for enough for how difficult it is to try and identify, particularly as a tier two or a tier three supplier in this industry, to work with Dong. We operate uh, using the Achilles qualification systems. And just to make it easy for you, we operate three. The first one is the most important one if you're a tier one supplier. And that's hard enough to identify if you're a tier one supplier or not. And that's uh, the Celica, which is a, no, the Nordic uh, system under Achilles. So if you're supplying foundations, turbines, vessels, cables, you need to be on Celica. In the UK, for the local categories, so Celica, global categories, UVDB, we use for the local categories, so substations, onshore cable, cabling, and, and a lot of the consultancy type services. And Connexio, if you're interested in our German market. What I say to you is please, please visit our site. It will list all of the, the uh, global categories and local categories. It's not incredibly comprehensive and we're trying to deal with this. And if you're not sure, please, please contact us because I'll be able to push you at least into the right direction where I can. The challenge is when you're two, tier two, three, and four, really to know where you sit because we have between two and 300 packages in typical for a major project. And uh, knowing whether you're a tier one is, is quite a challenge. It's a tr quite a challenge for me to guide you. But please uh, visit the sites and we're trying to provide as much uh, information as possible. There's also actually an awful lot of help out there as well. So uh, Achilles, we work very closely with. We're currently in the process of uh, launching uh, total supplier management system. So there will be a, a single portal as a supplier where you can uh, dock into Dong and it will push you into the relevant system as well, so you don't have this minefield of whether it's I'm a global or a local category. And we're hoping to launch that later on this year. And Killies are there to help you in this process so that, uh, so that you set yourself up correctly in the system. It's not enough just to be on the UVDB, on, on the Celica system. You have to be set up correctly. You have to have your categories set, set up correctly. Because we can't, you know, if I do a search on consultants, I might get one, two, three hundred, and there's no way that you want to uh, go in a one in three hundred chance of winning a tender. So, and we don't want to evaluate three hundred tenders. So we will use a system to shortlist down. And you, so you need to set yourselves up correctly on the systems. I'd also ask, um, mention, um, you know, you have some help in the UK. You have the Grow Initiative, 
I know that uh, they have uh, match funding, They're, they have expertise that uh, can offer, offer to help you um, set yourselves correctly up and give you advice on how to get into this supply chain. You know, it is a, it is a huge, huge opportunity, but it is a very complex industry. And uh, they have now developed quite a considerable uh, knowledge of, of the supply chain and be able to guide you in this area. So I don't uh, apologize for promoting the growth site and please go and visit their site. Uh, But the big, the big uh, opportunity for me, the key thing about delivering uh, UK, uh, UK content would be, I know I'd be naive to think I could just pluck this from, uh, from the UK and we know we're gonna need a significant uh, inward investment into the supply chain in UK and, and, and Siemens have demonstrated that. So please, you know, go talk to your uh, your uh, government representatives through UKTI or OIO through the Offshore Wind Investment Organization. Uh, if you're, uh, particularly if you're in the Nordic region, the, the, the Danish uh, UKTI team are very, very active because there's a lot of expertise there and we really would like to bring that into the UK. So please uh, go and talk to them as well as uh, the OIO team who have built some expertise in the UK. So there's a lot of help out, you, out for you there with um, what is clearly, uh, I would say, in excess of eight billion pounds worth of construction opportunity with uh, oh, 25 years O&M. So there's a 30 year, 30 year opportunity for, for UK PLC in offshore wind. And we're really confident that we are going to deliver this with three science CFDs we acquired Race Bank. We want to deliver Race Bank as well under the ROC regime. So we, as a company, we're very, very confident in offshore wind. So I just finalized with some uh, contact details. Um, you know, please come along to our stand and um, come and join us in this journey. Thank you. Thanks, Roger, for that very detailed explanation. Ray, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ron, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to say it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, speaking at the Share Fair again, um, particularly because it's nice to have something to, to announce and talk about and be very positive about. Uh, I'm going to cover a number of things today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the great news that was already mentioned, kindly by Roger, a little bit about the offshore market and some of the background that enabled us to make that decision. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we plan to do in Hull um, and then get really into the details of the supply chain opportunities. And some of those opportunities are more tactical and more here and now. And as part of the Share Fair Renewable UK, are very keen that the presenters actually really tell the companies in the audience how to engage with us, what opportunities are out there and what's coming up, because it's really about companies that are Renewable UK members winning business in the UK. So we're going to try and um, to do that. And also, as Roger did, give a little bit of advice on how to engage with us, what works, what doesn't. So a little bit of background. Um, obviously, uh, since we were at conference last year, a lot has happened. And I think if we look back 12 months, and um, as we've heard in the presentations, we now have offshore wind contracts that have CFDs in place. And I think if somebody had said that 12 months ago, we'd have actually been quite surprised that uh, um, we'd move that quickly. Uh, but government did what it said, got the Energy Act in at the end of 2013. And now we have some progress because developers know the strike prices that they can get for their projects. Um, the viable projects that are out there and have a good business case are being actively pursued. Um, the changeover from rocks to CFDs has manageable. I think the, the risks have been mitigated to a degree and we've heard from the NNG project which is still pursuing rocks. Um, and at last developers are making commitments to the supply chain. So we are seeing orders, commitments, preferred supplier arrangements coming through. So there is a greater confidence than there was. Um, and that of course meant great news for us, for Siemens, for Hull, and we hope for the whole of the UK and the whole of our industry. Um, this has been mentioned already. I think um, 
one of the difficulties of doing a presentation last is there's always a risk that some things come up. Um, but actually this focus on innovation, skills, competition, which I think actually may have been in everybody's presentation, is a good indication that the supply chain plan and process that government um, has uh, created for our industry um, has had the desired effect. There's no doubt that that has focused the minds of industry, of the developers, and of the supply chain. And we've seen some real progress over the last 12 months towards that. And I think everybody in our industry now understands that um, the impact from local economic development, from uh, return to the UK is a critical part of our industry and making that a, a kind of precondition of a CFD application um, enforces that link. But I think it's something that we understood anyway. I think um, particularly as, as foreign-owned companies, there's, there's a real understanding that um, the industry needs to return something to, keep to, to the UK to keep the public support that we enjoy. And public support for offshore wind remains very high. But I think as we develop and industrialise in the UK and communities and the UK as a whole start to see the jobs and the economic growth from that, we should be able to carry that support forward when people will actually see kind of factories growing up and investment in the UK. I think that will go a long way to help continue that support as well as obviously the obvious kind of um, environmental and carbon benefits. Um, so the local content issue is very important and obviously that's one of the drivers that enabled us to invest. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but it, it's really a point that um, right now the graph on the left um, for offshore wind shows really the three key markets are the UK is the dominant market, uh, Denmark and Germany are the three largest markets. And the point I wanted to make from this is going forward, and this is actually a, uh, data from um, a collection of the industry analysts, um, those three markets still remain at the top. Um, Belgium, Netherlands becoming more important, but it's still UK, Germany and Denmark which are the key markets for us. And of course in determining investment decisions, factory decisions uh, and a footprint for investment, uh, we of course are trying to serve all three of those markets. So it's not a case of saying the UK has a local content requirement, we need to do everything in the UK. We like other companies are looking to balance local content requirements coming from other jurisdictions as well and trying to set up a European footprint that makes sense for our projects. And for us, of course, as, as Siemens, we are um, very much focused in the UK, but of course essentially a Danish company with a German parent. So we equally carry those three markets in terms of our ownership and uh, guidance. So as has been said, we have managed to um, finally, it feels, get past that point of making the announcement on Hull, which is a, a great relief, I think, to to many of us, and a, and a huge, a huge success. Um, not myself, but many others have been involved in that project for a really long time, and the time and effort and commitment to bring that to the UK from a lot of our staff and those of our partners and the local politicians, local councils in whole region has been quite a spectacular effort. So we'll be um, investing as Siemens around 160 million in the Greenport Hull facility in partnership with uh, uh, Associated British Ports, obviously our partner in that project and the, the landowner and port operator of Hull. The total investment will create around 1,000 new jobs um, and we expect to have the first manufacturing activity um, sometime during 2016. So four significant elements for that. The, the photo you see is the, um, the Albert Dock area, which is the kind of project execution site. And uh, those familiar with the, the round three map will know that something like 80% of the um, investment and the projects in round three that remain are down the east coast. So it's a very kind of central location for serving those projects. Uh, we'll do final assembly of the nacelles as part of that facility in the large shed. Um, but we also announced as part of the, the investment earlier this year that we're going to set up some primary manufacturing of blades in a, a site called Paul, which is um, uh, kind of co-located just a few kilometres to the right further down the river. Um, a link road between the two going through the port land. And that was a big step for us because it is um, the first time that we'll have done uh, blades in the UK. And that's a very significant impact to the local communities. Blades obviously is quite a a labour-intensive process, and so the, uh, the large part of the jobs 
um, comes from actually manufacturing blades. And of course, from a local economic development opportunity, that's a wonderful opportunity to create local employment in a good kind of shop floor factory type environment that is exactly the kind of investment that, that areas like Hull really need. And of course, a lot of technology around that as well. But we'll also be putting into that site a logistics distribution center, which will support our service activities. So it's quite a, quite a complex project. It's obviously a, a long-term project. We still have a number of hurdles to go through, some planning to do, and then obviously um, a commencement of civil works going forward um, for that. Um, I have to say the response we've had from Hull, but from the industry in general, has been absolutely fantastic. It's, it's rare that you do a big project and everybody supports but it's been pretty unanimous, I think. It's, it's hard to find any, anybody with any downside or objection, and that's, that's really encouraging. Uh, we've had many thousand applications um, from people wanting jobs already, and of course the supply chain interest that it's generated has been, been very significant and has, has kept us a little busy, as you would imagine, over the past couple of months. Um, and of course, while we've been waiting for that investment, um, the industry's been moving forward. Uh, and there's a point here for me that... Um, Everybody talks about supply chain and thinks of components and factories. But of course what we've been doing is been getting ready for a whole new industry. And a key part of that is skills. This isn't just about components, manufacturing, hardware. This is about having the people ready to deliver a new industry for the UK. So we've been investing heavily in our training facility with the picture there shows the, the complete nacelles we have in the uh, training centre at Newcastle and the, uh, the control centre that we've been building. So we've been really pushing ahead, um, uh, employing more staff, really building up the skills that we'll need as the industry continues to develop in the UK. Um, getting on to the kind of procurement end and the end that you're interested in, um, of course we've got a number of different groups of procurement activity that we're going to be looking for going forward. There is the factory itself, the civils, professional services, drainage, those kind of things. Then there are components from manufacturer, which is the, the thing that people always kind of um, imagine as our supply chain. But actually right now and going forward, a lot of the spend that we have in the UK, and it is considerable in previous years, we've spent something like 100 million with UK companies, is actually around the, the execution of the projects that we have and the goods and services from that. We also have our electrical transmission business, building the onshore and offshore substations, uh, and a good track record there, particularly on the, uh, building the platforms and um, significant impact to the UK supply chain from that side of the business. And then, of course, there is the through-life service activities, typically 25 years on a wind farm, that actually creates uh, a lot of opportunities. By its nature, it tends to be in the UK, so sometimes I think we overlook the fact that that's a significant contributor to the UK part of the picture, but it is very important to us, and we have a very extensive service business in the UK based out of Newcastle. Um, similar to the other companies that have spoken before us, um, environment, health and safety is always top of our list looking for suppliers. Um, there is no place to hide in this industry in terms of health and safety performance. Quite rightly, there is a, uh, an incredible focus on that throughout our supply chain. And as, as previous speakers have said, anybody that wants to supply into this industry, that has to be top of your list as well. And of course, behind that, we look for the normal things that anybody looks for in a supplier, competence, delivery, value for money. But above all, suppliers need to bring something to us. Um, I get a lot of supply chain approaches of component manufacturers particularly that say, I make this widget. And that's fine, but unless that's bringing us a significant cost advantage or there is a real reason. That has to be the, the kind of key that opens the door to get us interested. Um, so our approach to the supply chain, we do a lot of industry engagement as all of the other companies that have spoken today. So working with key intermediaries, Renewable UK obviously we are a big supporter of, we work very closely with the, the supply chain group, events like this. We've done a number of events with AIC, have very close relationships with them. Um, Roger mentioned the GROW program and we've been, a, a, again, a great supporter of that, very involved in the, the design of that program. Uh, we are making referrals into GROW and equally GROW are finding companies and engaging with us. Um, so particularly, I think, for the, the SMA companies, uh, there's a real strength there now that's growing. I know GROW have a side event a little later this morning, um, so any companies that are interested in learning more about that can do so today. 
We're also engaged very much with the renewable energy catapult, the Crown Estate and others. And of course one of the things we've also um, started to do is very much work with the developers as they have specific projects having local events because of course there is a, a kind of strong supply chain pull and opportunity in the areas where we're building wind farms. Um, Renewable UK, as I say very much, kind of um, want these share fairs to be about getting opportunities out there and engaging with the, the members and the supply chain base. Um, so here are some of the things that we are actually going to be coming out to the market and looking for over the next few months. So there are six categories there, the manpower installation services and some subheadings, uh, fabrication and welding, which typically for us is uh, blade frames, blade transport equipment, uh, towel manufacture is interesting to us, um, engineering consumables, tools, plant air, off-site accommodation. So in the short term, we're particularly interested in these six categories. And we are going to be holding a series of events focused on those. And we're particularly interested in, in companies in those areas to, to be contacting us now. Um, but we would ask for patience, I think, on some of the other areas, particularly some of the kind of factory input. Clearly, it's two or three years away before we have the factory up and running. So... Uh, suppliers do need to kind of have patience and bear with us on some of those things. By all means, express interest, but we're not going to be out tendering for the catering facilities for the factory in the next few weeks. That's uh, still a little bit of where we're. Um, but these are the areas that are kind of hot of our list, and we've made a commitment to Renewable UK that as we move forward, we'll continue to share and update that list and make sure that the members are given opportunities to feature in our supply chain. Um, how to engage... Um, I think, again, a little as Roger said, key to this is understanding who's your customer. It can be very complex. It can be very difficult for companies to navigate their way through the supply chain. Uh, perhaps half of the inquiries I get are for equipment that Siemens isn't the client for. So I get people selling, trying to sell components for foundations and all kinds of things that aren't our scope of supply. And we try and help and direct towards the developers or others. Um, but it's really important that companies really try and navigate their way through and understand who they're selling to. And that can be actually very complex. Um, it's not as always as obvious as it sounds who the client may be. And for us, particularly as you get to some of the second and third tier suppliers, um, component suppliers may be, for example, manufacturing machine components that will go into a hydraulic power unit that we will buy from a tier one to us. And, of course, we don't know who some of those suppliers are. So it's quite difficult for, for some of the, uh, the companies in the law tiers to really understand. But it is about this kind of event, networking, research, being out, and understanding what you offer. Clearly, one of the things that drives us towards UK content and drives others is that there is a real economic rationale and a common sense about manufacturing in the UK. The blades that we make, the towers, some of our components are huge. So there's a natural logistics advantage. Um, but for other companies, this is all about cost reduction. How are you going to save us money? Simply doing what we already do at the same cost probably isn't going to get you across the doorstep and into a contract. But I would like to say it is working. It is, um, it is happening, and we're finding some really good examples. I spoke actually at the conference. A guy came over to me yesterday, and they are a small SME company based in Scotland. They've developed some specialist tooling, um, in partnership with us, and he was very excited because last week they signed their first order with Siemens for some equipment for this. So it can be done. SMEs are finding us, finding a niche or something specific that we want, and finding a way in to us. So it is starting to work, and of course we have that pressure to, to really be active and really seek local content wherever we can, and naturally we'll be doing that. So leave the support networks, do your homework, understand as much as you can, and come with a compelling proposition to the people you're trying to sell to. And finally, some contact details. Mine are there, and we're very open. We'll take inquiries from anybody. My colleague, Paul Savides, is, is here, and he's going to be around um, after this event. He's leading for procurement for us in the UK, and he'll be around the stand, I think, today. So um, contact myself, Paul. We'll try and give advice wherever we can. Um, we're really positive about the response we've had, as I say, both from um, the skills and employment side, but from the supply chain as well. There is a real um, buzz about the industry and, the announce and our announcement and supply chain moving forward, and we've heard from a number of the developers that there are, once again, we're in the nice position of having a strong project pipeline 
and some business to win. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ray, for that presentation. I, I, I tried to summarise some of the key points as I was going through, then realised I didn't have enough paper. But I'll try and just summarise some, some of the points for everyone. I think, first of all, my thanks to the speakers for giving a very honest and open view on what they see to be the future, both in offshore wind, but probably more importantly, their place and their space in offshore wind and how they see it being delivered in, in a very aggressive timescale. The projects would that were discussed really 2016, 2017, 18 and 19. I know many of us, myself included, have waited a long time for perhaps UK government to come good on the EMR. That is now past us. We heard that, that generally speaking the CFD has been accepted well within the industry so we can no longer complain about the UK commitment. We've heard a lot about supply chain management. We've heard a lot about the importance of the UK supply chain. And yes, perhaps UK government have taken some initiative to say that it is important and it will be a strong part of a commitment to developers in the future. But perhaps that's the right thing. But perhaps the time is now right to, to take some of the experience of local companies. And we've heard from an entrepreneurial company mainstream which many of us perhaps thought that they were based in Ireland did a little bit of work in the UK but actually what we heard they were very entrepreneurial and have a global presence their problem is consenting of projects so government if you're listening please push Marine Scotland please push UK um, consenting to the fullest to allow these projects to develop for this very strong entrepreneurial company International players, Repsol and EDPR. My background is in oil and gas. I'm familiar with both of those companies. They represent themselves as being strong in project management and able to deliver large, complex projects. And I think the emphasis there is more on the complex than it is on the large. They are large by nature, but complex because of the environment that we're moving into, particularly in round three. But again, waiting for consenting of their project. They have a robust road path to get road map to get from where they are today to where they need to be in only two years time. Now if I can track my notes correctly. Moving on to, on to Roger, how can we not be impressed with the rise of Dong over the last six months? The consenting of four projects or three soon to be four projects the investment, which I think you said, Roger, if I wrote it down correctly, was something like eight billion mm -hmm. over the next few years, um, a significant partner. Even if, and some will like this, some will not like it, even if they are happy with their contracting style, it is different to that of EDPR and Repsol. That does not make it wrong. And actually a, a good balance of opportunities, both in multi-contract forum and in more EPC, I think is a very mature business model for all of us to consider over the next three to four years. Roger gave us a good explanation of each of the projects, I won't go into those, but he also talked about the need for standardization and how that's been successful in working with people like Atkins. He talked about innovation and using innovation to reduce cost and the need for competition to keep costs under control. I don't think that is a particularly scary proposition, I think it's a mature business model that we all respect and understand. But he also spoke about having a, a sustainable UK supply chain. This is an investment for the next 20 years, not for the next two or three. O&M is going to be important both to all of these gentlemen on the stage, but to the industry as a whole. And O&M has to be considered for the next 20 to 25 years to get it right. Dong has a very robust process for procure, procuring um, packages and we were encouraged to visit their website and to make most use of that and to seek advice. And with, with Siemens' commitment very well explained by Ray, um, we say in whole but actually it's the UK, the understanding and pre-investment in skills. I was certainly surprised to hear perhaps um, not too strongly given Siemens' overall position offshore wind, but the amount of work which is going on 
with regard to getting skills in the right place at the right time to deliver these projects. If people cannot deliver projects, then they should not be in the business because fundamentally that is the business of offshore wind today, both in terms of the innovation of the manufacturer, but also in terms of the ability to stand behind the commitments that you make when you sign contracts in these very complex, very difficult offshore environments. We heard of a, a European footprint, a, a pre-investment already in the UK of 160 million and a creation of 1,000 jobs in Hull going forward. He talked about not just factory buildings and components, but also the full life cycle of these projects and that importance. We also heard about the relevance and very important relevance of industry engagement organizations such as RUK, EIC, the GROW initiative, OREC, and the, the need for the Crown Estate. Siemens will spend a great deal of money over the next two years. Get ready for that investment to be coming to market. Understand the market that you're coming into. Understand what you offer. Very important message. And leverage that through the support networks I've just described. So if I could just to finally close, can I say thank you once again to our speakers, can I say thank you to our now grown audience, clearly the, um, whatever happened last night has finally woken people up, um, but thank you for your participation, people are available on the stands as explained, uh, and I'll now uh, close the session, thank you very much. <laughs>